guys, it's Z Dog. Come on in, come on in, come on in. I just went live to my supporter tribe only because I usually do lives for them and I got so worked up. I was like, you know what? How about guys, we finish this broadcast and I go live to the whole page and give a quick update on my thinking on coronavirus right now because you're getting it all over the press. You're hearing Sanjay Gupta and Dr. Oz and Dr. Drew and Dr. Pepper and everybody talking about coronavirus. Here's... <laughs> Do you know who I talk to about coronavirus? And this is gonna sound really cheesy. I talk to my dad about coronavirus. Why? Because he is a foreign medical graduate. He's 80 years old, an internal medicine doctor with a pulmonary subspecialty that he did, that he trained for and never really practiced because he loved primary care, took care of really disadvantaged immigrant patients in the Central Valley of California. That was his thing, private practice, independent doc. And he's 80 living off of you know invested money that he saved over years and scrimped and saved and came with nothing in his pocket. And I called him today because it's my parents' 50th anniversary, their 50th wedding anniversary, the golden anniversary, right? And so I'd sent, you know, I sent them flowers and my wife picked out some cool little cookies and different things like that we sent it to them. And so I called them and I'm like, hey, so what's going on? And my dad was like, you know, the stock market dropped like, a thousand percent. And I'm like, yeah, I saw that shit. Don't sweat it, man. That's just, that's what happens like when people panic. And he's like, these people are idiots. Like they're hoarding toilet paper. Okay. I've seen rabies. I've seen tuberculosis. We've done the swine flu. We've been through all this stuff and they're panicking and selling all the stocks. Okay. That's my retirement. And so I said, dad, aren't you scared? You're 80. You have a little COPD from living in the Central Valley, which has the crappiest air quality in the world. So you got, you got lung disease just from living in a polluted environment. You never smoked. Aren't you worried? Because you're one of those people that is 80, that has comorbidities, that has like a 10, 15% mortality if you, get, if you get hospitalized with this thing. And he's like, no. <laughs> the statistical chances of me getting this are low. The fact that people are running, I'm like, so, so what are you doing? Are you going out? Are you doing, yeah. And I wash my hands. I don't touch my eyes. I do all this stuff, right? Why is everybody panicking? Now, here's a guy who's been through it all and he knows. And you know what? I would trust his ass over the media, over the general panic, because you've got to remember these guys have skin in the game for making people panic. It's like what they do, like Sanjay Gupta standing there and going, it's a shit show, is actually really in his best interest to do that, right? And the truth is, it is a shit show when it comes to our medical system's preparedness for a pandemic that would kill a lot more people than this one's going to. What this has shown, so the public, okay, here's what I'll tell the public. Calm the hell down. Stop buying toilet paper and stocking up on garbage, okay? Try to avoid the random public gatherings if you don't wanna get sick. That's a good piece of advice in general during a severe flu season, which this is, and yet you still won't get your flu shot, okay? But also, if you have a cough or a cold or a little bit of congestion, don't come see the doctor or nurse practitioner or urgent care or standalone clinic or hospital. You shouldn't do that ever, ever. Okay, that's just basic 101 patient education that we've failed to do, okay? Because, you know why? Because we get paid to see these ding-dong cases that, have, that, that just, they don't need us. So what are we gonna do? Give them an antibiotic for their virus? Are we gonna tell them, you know, go get rest and fluid? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's, you don't need to see us for that, okay? You got a high fever, you're having shortness of breath, you have other alarm symptoms, that's a different subject, but people are like, well, I just always get a Z pack for this. Okay, you come into the, to the doctor for that, you're just being an ass. Not only that, but you're more likely to get sick from what's in the doctor's office than you are from what you have that you're coming to see the doctor for, right? So this is pure idiocy, idiocy. When I was in college at Berkeley, I got mono during finals. I took finals anyways, because I don't give an F. I got mono, I made the mistake of going to student health. And then I caught strep throat. And sitting in that waiting room, I didn't need to go to the doctor really for mono. Like I was okay, like I could feel my own spleen. It wasn't gonna burst, right? 
it's, it's conservative management. And the same goes for most viral stuff, including COVID-19 coronavirus. For the most part, if you just stayed home or you texted or emailed or Skyped or phoned your doctor, unfortunately, they don't get paid for that. So they're not going to want to do that. They're going to want to see you typically. That's the typical incentive, right? That's what we have to fix as a system. If we just did that, you would probably be way better off. You'd save a ton of money because believe me, every time you see the doctor, you're going to come back with a diagnosis. You're going to get a pill or some shit, a new thing, a new test, and it's going to probably more likely harm you than hurt you. And this is what we won't tell you because how we make a living is doing this, right? Let's be honest with ourselves. Now, there are tons of good people who don't do that, but the system is misincentivized. We have to fix that. Okay, so that's for patients. Calm the heck down. Stop clogging up our system. Now, for everybody else on the physician, nursing, urgent care, outpatient, ambulance side, this is a shit show, you guys. That We had the Chinese, okay, Figure this thing out in December. Whatever you believe about conspiracies, they're bullshit. They had genotype. They were looking at the virus. They, they had an unprecedented response clamping down on 16 million people in a province. Try to do that in the US and you'll have a civil war. In China, it's just like, okay, bro, whatever you say. Even if there's leakage, they bought the world time to start working on vaccine, to ramp up testing, to start to ramp up public health stuff, to deal with containment strategies. And what happened? The US fucking fumbles it. It's a total shit show, right? They had all this time to ramp up testing and figure out. And so what ends up happening? Probably it's spreading in the community everywhere. We have no tests, so we don't know. And so what's ending up happening that people are showing up infecting sick people in nursing homes. You know, doctors are probably catching it and spreading it and not even knowing because so many people are asymptomatic. We, people seem to think that we know mortality figures for this thing, but we have no clue because we don't have a proper denominator. We have this many people died, this many people have been diagnosed. How many people are infected? We have no clue. And anyone who tells you they do have a clue, in other words, that they believe this number or they believe that number, that they're just making shit up and pulling it out of their ass. They don't know because we have no idea how symptomatic this thing. P kids could have it with no symptoms. Well, are you counting them then in terms of the overall infection rate, in terms of where they're spreading it, in terms of mortality risk? No, it could be a 0.1% mortality, which is still like as bad as flu. It's terrible. It's probably higher than that, right? So the amount of generalized uh, public health fumbling on this. Now, let's take it to the next level. What about our hospital administration? So these are the people, let's say they're non-clinical, all right? Let's say it's an MBA running a hospital. Great, they're good at business. They would argue that their one reason for being is to keep patients safe and allow the proper resourcing and functioning of a hospital so that it's financed well, that they have the right capacity, that they figured out material management, making sure they have enough things in stock, that they've come up with training protocols, figured out how to train and make sure that they have a really fancy electronic health record that measures all the widgets so that we know if something's happening, we catch it in the big data. And when we catch it in the big data, then we can do something right there. How's that worked out? So the one reason for their existence to prove to us that they aren't fucking parasites is now. And how, what are they going to do? Well, I'll tell you, from the messages I'm getting from nurses and doctors and people on the front lines, particularly in the Bay Area, they're not doing, they are fucking up, right? They're not ready at all. And so this is the thing. You may have a thing like if we had no social media, if we had no news, if we had none of that, we probably would be just fine. Some bunch of people would die. It would be like a severe flu season. We wouldn't know what was going on exactly. There wouldn't be panic though, and we wouldn't learn enough from it. So we have to have this open flow of information, but the downside is people are either they're not doing anything useful with it or they're doing harmful shit with it. So this is the bottom line. Calm the hell down. Unlike me, it's, I feel like Walter Sobchak in The Big Lebowski. I'm calmer than you, dude. Calmer than you. Calm down. Prepare hold our leaders accountable when they don't. Like if this turns out to be that we're like in Italy where ICUs are being overwhelmed and staff are already at very low morale, but you know what, listen, this is the other thing I hear from a lot of people who are like, oh, it's terrible, we're all scared. I get it, dude, I totally get it, it's terrifying. I mean, it, it is scary. But remember H1N1, who remembers that? Huh? 
I was there in the hospital on call that long winter when we were seeing young people dying, young people dying of flu in the ICU. Old people dropping like flies. I mean, it was horrible. The hospital was full on divert all the time. Every single hospitalist, every resident, every intern was exhausted. Every nurse was exhausted. We were running low on PPE then. Nobody knew what was going on. Staff were calling in sick. We didn't know what really what was happening. There was an element of the unknown in it. And we got through it, guys. And we will get through this too. But if we don't come out stronger on the other end, then this was a complete disaster, all right? So we have to, we have to do better. And you know, we gotta hold CDC accountable, we gotta hold local public health departments. Maybe we need different resourcing for this. Maybe we need a more um, national structure. Maybe we need a more local structure. I don't know the answers yet because we don't have enough information yet as to what's even going wrong, right? Carrie Housen's raising her hand. I do, I do. And you know, Beth Shower says, I was a jail nurse for H1N1. It sucked, it, dude, it sucked. It sucked. How quickly we forget how much it sucked. You know, my dad was telling me that too. He's like, remember swine flu? That was a shit show too. He doesn't use the word shit show. He said like, I don't know what he says. It's like an Indian equivalent. It was a goddamn mess. These bastards weren't ready at all. That's an Indian thing. These bastards. The other one is swine. You call people swine. And it was a swine flu, so it worked out really well. By the way, stock market's dipping. I'll tell you, man, it's a pretty good buying opportunity in the near future. I'm just saying, because you know that there's going to be a pent up demand. Now, the final call to action on this, we're going to keep updating you on this shit. Um, I feel like we're counter-programming for the insanity that you're seeing everywhere. So hopefully this isn't too insane too. But I think the bottom line is, dude, general public, like I keep saying, do the things we're talking about. Wash your hands. Don't touch your eyes. Keep a little bit of distance, but don't shut your life down. And please don't go to the doctor unless you have serious symptoms, which we may talk about tomorrow on the show, but like cough and cold and low-grade fever and all that. Now look, if you're older, if you have comorbidities, if you're immunocompromised, that's a different game, okay? You get precedence and that's what we ought to have hospitals for, is for people like you that are at real risk, all right? So one, uh, look at this, uh, Shauna Curley, I was a pregnant nurse during swine flu. Hell yeah, I'm glad you're doing okay. Um, and back to that patient ed 101 part about not going to the doctor for common uh, cold things. Couldn't uh, a big part of that be due to employers requiring a doctor's note if you call in sick? Trent Dennison, great point. Our PTO system in this country is fucked up. What happens when you tell nurses to quarantine at home? How's that going to work out? Who's going to staff and cover? How are they going to be paid? What do you do with doctors who make their money based on RVUs and clicks? How are they going to make money? when they're at home. So do you think they're not gonna lie about when they're having symptoms and maybe just put a mask on? Like, I'll tell you, during swine flu, people were coming in dying and just they had a little flimsy ass mask on to protect their patients from them. Like, we're, folks, 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 we're only as good as our incentives. We are only as good as our incentives. We gotta fix those incentives. Because when they're wrong, we're going to do the wrong thing. I started this show talking about how people in medicine would want to see you in the clinic. Your, do your employer wants you to go get a note because that's how we bill. Maybe that got to change, guys. And I've talked about that a million times. We're talking about Health 3.0. Um, and yeah, clean your phones, Heather Wright. Clean your stethoscope if you're a nurse or a doctor or a respiratory therapist, someone who uses a scope. And if you're an administrator, pull your goddamn head out of your ass and start making yourself more than a freaking leech because that's what it feels like to frontline people who are demoralized, okay? It's like, yeah, we've decided to make an intervention. Um, we're uh, going to work from home today. That's what the administrators would say, right? Have fun storming the castle. And I know this isn't across the board. There are wonderful, beautiful leaders out there who aren't clinical too, who are doing everything they can, who are taking this as a personal quest to keep their patients and their staff safe and sound. And to those people, we tip your hat. You are bright spots. I want to hear those stories too in the messages. All right, guys, I love you. Do me a favor. Thanks to everyone who donated stars during this. Become a supporter of this show. Sign up and you get even deeper dives than what we're doing right now. Um, and it helps 
really us do what we do so that we don't have commercial entanglements. It really, really helps us a lot. Share this video, spread some light and rationality. And if you're on the front lines, we are with you. We're all in this together. Do not despair. It is going to get worse before it gets better. And if the Italian um, experiences any model, it will get hard. It will get hard, but that's what we trained to do. We hold our leaders accountable. We work together to try to get through this, and we will. All right, guys? I love you, and we out. Peace.